Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and each episode we delve into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration on your journey to healing. Today, I have an exciting guest, Dr. David Brownstein. He's a board-certified family physician who utilizes the best of conventional and alternative therapies. He's a medical director for the Center of Holistic Medicine in West Broomfield, Michigan. Ironic, because I live in Broomfield, Colorado. <laughs> West Broomfield. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan and Wayne State University School of Medicine. Dr. Brownstein is the member of the Academy of sorry, American Academy of Family Physicians and serves on the board of the International College of Integrative Medicine. He's the father of two beautiful physicians, Haley and Jessica, and a retired soccer coach. He has lectured internationally about his success using natural therapies, and he's authored 16 books, including Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It, fifth edition, and his newest book, A Holistic Approach to Viruses. And today we're going to talk about one of your favorite topics and one that you are a world leader in, and that's iodine. So welcome to the show. Well, I'm glad to be here, Joe. Happy happy to talk to you. Yeah, excited to dive into this topic. Um, tell us just a little bit, first of all, of how did you get into medicine, and uh, especially the realm of integrative and functional um, holistic medicine? Well, I didn't start off that way. I started off wanting to be a conventional doctor, model after my family doctor. I grew up with a severe case of asthma and um I, you know, multiple ER trips, multiple asthma medications and, and asthma and allergies and things. And so I went to the doctor a fair amount. We grew up in a conventional household. We didn't take any vitamins. We didn't talk about diet. Um, we went to the doctor when we were sick. We took whatever the doctor said. We never questioned anything. And so I went to medical school with those parameters, just to be a conventional doctor. I wanted to be a family doctor, modeled after my doctor. Went to, you know... The University of Michigan, the national champs. Yes. <laughs> I love it. National champs. I worked hard for that, by the way. Um, and uh, Wayne State Medical School, and then did a family practice residency and joined a busy conventional family practice office, not far from where I'm at now. And I was, it's all I talked about doing. Um, I thought it was my uh, calling, you know, and Around six months into that, I start to get some anxiety pop up out of nowhere. I remember I didn't sleep for three nights or, you know, little, little sleep for three nights out of the blue. And I get up and get ready to go to work after that. And I tell my wife, Allison, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. We met at 18. We met at orientation at U of M. Wow. And um, that's all I talked about to her from that moment on. This was my calling. That's what I wanted to do. And she said, what's wrong? I'm like, I can't do this. I'm not helping people. I'm prescribing all these drugs that aren't treating their, unless they had an infection, it wasn't treating their underlying cause of their problems. It was, and I'm having to use all these other drugs to treat the problems from the first drugs. I said, I can't do this for the next 30 years. 
And she said, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. And she was pregnant with Haley. Yeah. Um, very pregnant at that time when that happened. And um, the short version of the story was a patient, a patient hooked me up with a chiropractor, his chiropractor. His name was Dr. Robert Radke. He was a functional chiropractor who knew functional biochemistry. When I met him, which I didn't want to meet him because I used to tell people, don't go see chiropractors. Right. <laughs> <They're> dangerous. <laughs> and in my anxiety and lack of sleep, I agreed to meet him. And I remember it was, it was a Tuesday night dinner. I called him and we set that up. And as I got home from work and I told Allison, I'm not going, it's a, I'm not going to meet this chiropractor. It's a waste of my time. And she said, you already scheduled it. It's too late. And as I was walking out the door, she said, be nice. And so I met him. He was super smart. He knew all his functional biochemistry. I didn't know. I got an A in biochemistry at the University of Michigan. I got an A in med school in biochemistry. I didn't find it very hard. You memorize pathways and spit them back out in the exam. And you never know why you're doing that or what right. the, you know why you're doing it, but what, what the clinical purpose was, you didn't know. So there's no clinical purpose to doing that. And Dr. Radke's talking about clinical uses of biochemistry, which I still utilize today. And so I got home from that meeting. He brought a book with me, Healing with Nutrition by Jonathan Wright. I read yes. long into the night, two or three in the morning, and I had to work the next day. And I got up for work and I wasn't tired and I was excited. And um, I called my dad before I went to work and I said, hey, can you come in the office? I want to check a few blood tests on you. He had his first heart attack at 40, a second heart attack at 42. He had a couple of bypass surgeries and numerous angioplasties. He was on 12 medications for cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes. And he looked awful. He, he was pale and pasty. He looked like he was going to die at any moment. We were all waiting for the phone call. He died. Continual angina for 20 years, popping nitros like they were candy, and waiting for the phone call. So I called him and I said, hey, Dad, can you come in the office? I want to draw some blood work. And I drew two blood tests on him. I drew a thyroid panel instead of just the TSH is what I was taught in med school. I drew a full thyroid panel and I drew his testosterone levels, which no one had checked. His testosterone levels came back a few days later as below detectable limits, you know, near zero. And his thyroid was in the reference range, but in the lower part of the reference range. So I put him on two things, natural thyroid hormone, natural testosterone. And seven days later, he calls me up and he says, I haven't taken a nitro today. My chest pain's gone. It was the first time in 20 years. He started to pink up instead of pale and pasty. He, his shortness of breath and, and, and shortness of breath on exertion went away. 30 days later, I check his cholesterol, which was in the 300s on medication. It's below 200, not changing any of his bad dietary habits, which he never changed. Right. He looked better. He acted better. His friends were asking my mother, you know, what, what's he doing? You know, he looks so much better. And he could do things now without shortness of breath and chest pain. And I said, that's what I want to do in medicine. I went to my partners and I said, I was negotiating and buying for a partnership. And I said, I'm, I need to leave. And they said, what's wrong? And I'm like, I want to go do holistic medicine. They knew, I told them what I was doing with my father. And they said, what's that? And I said, I don't know, but I'm going to have to figure this out. And um, 30 years later, I'm still figuring it out, still learning. Got a better idea of what it is now, but um, I left and started, you know, doing just, I did a 180 in my practice and that, that was my impetus. And, you know, my experience and probably your experience has been for most people to switch from that conventional orthodoxy that you were taught, especially if you bought into it, like I did. Yeah. It's either you are, you are sick or a family member sick that yes. caused you to search. And um, it's 30 years later now, it was the best move I ever did. I find medicine exciting and fun and I'm glad I did it and I wouldn't. The only thing I would change is I guess I would have had the passion for this a little bit earlier, but it was fine the way it worked out. And, um, you know, now I'm working with my girls and it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, that's amazing legacy. And what your story um, just shows so true to so many of us in, in medicine is we go in really wanting to be healers and solve problems and, and solve the medical mysteries and the pathways. And we actually learn the pathways in medical school, but many of our patients and those listening may not know we don't use those. We're given, you know, here's the diagnosis, ICD-10 now, and then here's the drug. And that's really the mechanistic approach to medicine. And so that's why a lot of our listeners, a lot of our patients are a little frustrated with medicine because they they also want to know the why, like what's under the hood of the car that went wrong. And when you got that book from Jonathan Wright, which I know well, we both kind of found that um, the mechanisms behind disease fascinating. And like you, I love what I do every day because it gives us a chance to solve problems and actually reverse what used to be considered irreversible. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, biochemistry, I, 
I liked biochemistry. I did I mean, chemistry I got. And I, I did well in undergrad. I did well in med school with biochemistry. I thought, hey, you know, I was pretty good with chemistry, biochemistry. And I didn't know a thing. Right. So how to apply it to patients in front of me. Now, every supplement, every drug, every diet, everything that I look at, I think about how does this impact the human biochemistry and physiology? And am I going to support these pathways or am I going to block them? I mean, you know, it's not, and it's a different paradigm way of thinking, unlike how you and I were taught, as you just said, we're taught how to diagnose pathology and how to prescribe the one drug to treat that. And that's it. Yeah. Monkeys, yeah, so monkeys much... can do it. Monkeys right, can... right. <laughs> and it's so fun when you do the kind of medicine we do, because we really get to think about problem solving every day. And what I find is fascinating is we can use nutrients almost as a drug to shift pathways. It's not the drug, but it's much more natural, but we're literally using the right doses to shift the mechanistic biology of the human body. And we can do it with nutrition. And we're not poisoning receptors. We're not blocking blocking uh and we're not poisoning the enzymes and blocking receptors and doing that we're we're giving we were designed pretty well if we just give it the basic raw materials it needs that we were designed for the human body can do pretty cool things through, yes. through all yes 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 amen um so one of our topics today is iodine and you have been the leading author you've written a fifth edition book now um i don't know how many you've sold but a, a lot i read your book years and years ago when it first came out and one reason this is very close to home is because I, I think you know a little bit of my story, 25 years old on a farm with chemical exposures and probably um, competitors for iodine um, got breast cancer, which of course is related. And this is interesting. I don't know if you know this part that was 25 years old, my own breast cancer diagnosis. Several years later, my sister at 28 had thyroid cancer. So two girls, same environment. I'd love to know, and you can talk personal if you want, as far as like why that might be related to iodine with the thyroid and the breast and two sisters, because you know the whole story there, don't you? Well, I mean, iodine is an essential element. We can't live without it. Every cell in the body needs and requires iodine. It's concentrated in the glandular tissues. So the thyroid, the glandular tissue consists of the thyroid ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, and pancreas. Think about what the problems we're having today. We, the fastest growing cancer in the United States, thyroid cancer. Breast cancer affecting about one in seven women across the U.S., adult women. Um, prostate cancer thought to affect one in three older men. We got epidemic increases of ovarian, uterine, pancreatic cancer. When I was in my training 30 years ago, if people got pancreatic cancer were alcoholics, older alcoholics, and older people. And I never saw younger people with pancreatic cancer. I have patients now in their 40s getting diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Yeah. Um, I never saw women in their teens and mm -hmm. 20s getting diagnosed with breast cancer ever. Right. And um, now I got, you know, I just went to a funeral of a 28 year old patient of mine from breast cancer, um, ovarian, uterine. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what's happening. And it's been my premise that iodine deficiency is a large part. I, I don't think, you know, it's the 100% answer to it, but it's, it's a high percentage that answer to it. And the reason is, Iodine's job in the glandular tissue is to maintain the normal architecture of the glandular tissue. So if we call this the normal architecture, it's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's as, as it should be. That includes all those glands, the thyroid, ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, and pancreas. And iodine deficiency has been shown in animal, test tube, and human studies. It starts a progression of first cysts start to form in those tissues. Um, right now, uh, an autopsy study showed 88% of U.S. women have fibrocystic breast disease, which is a precursor to breast cancer. 50, 60 years ago was 3% of women on an autopsy study. Um, so, so first thing that happens in iodine deficiency is cysts start to form in those tissues. If it goes on longer, the cysts become hard and nodular. If it goes on longer, you take a biopsy of them, they become hyperplastic, which is a precursor to cancer, mm -hmm. the disordered structure of the cell. And then cancer is the end of that road. Now, animal test tube and human studies has been shown that iodine repletion not only can halt this pathway wherever it catches it, but reverse it. And I've seen I've seen that happen in my patients. And so, you know, the human body, we were designed by our maker to get enough iodine in so we don't get cysts and nodules and hyperplasia and cancer of our breasts and our ovaries and uterus and pancreas and thyroid and, you know, all that stuff. And um, I think we're facing the consequences. And I, I think that if you... You know, our iodine requirements now are, are more than our predecessors were because we are exposed to chemicals, as you were on the farm, that these these toxic halides, you know, in, in the periodic so table, when we were in undergrad, 
mm -hmm. or high school, if you took chemistry, um, is group 17 are the halides on the right side of the periodic table. And there's four, four, four halides. There's five halides now. There was a fifth one discovered, but we don't really, I don't think there's any human yeah. interaction with that one. The four halides that have human interaction are fluoride, um, chloride, bromide, and iodine. And I gave them in, in order yeah. of the molecular yeah. weight. Um, two of those halides are essential. We can't live without them. That's that's iodine and chloride. Um, and two of the halides are non-essential toxic elements we shouldn't be exposed to. That's bromide and fluoride. Now, fluoride, we can argue whether it helps cavities, but yeah, it poisons hundreds, if not thousands of enzymes in the body. It's been associated with osteosarcoma and other cancers. It's a extremely toxic electronegative nutrient, uh, not a, a, a element that shouldn't be in the human body. But um, so in, in that four halide common, and I gave them in the order, bromide and iodine are closest to one another. So bromide is very similar size. It's a little smaller than iodine, but we have iodine receptors all through our body and every cell in the body needs and requires it. It's concentrated in the glands, as I said before. And if we're iodine deficient, bromide, all those halides are competitive inhibitors of one another. So if you get too much of one, it can kick out another one. And if you get too much bromide, it's going to tend to kick out iodine and bromide can bind to where iodine receptors are. So it's been shown in animal studies that you can brominate iodine, brominate iodine receptors in the thyroid gland. And you can, instead of thyroid hormone, such as thyroxin, which is T4 or four atoms of iodine attached to thyroglobulin, those four atoms can be brominated. So you could have T4, but it could be brominated T4 instead of T4 yes. iodinated. Now we were designed for T4 iodinated. We don't really know what the consequences of the brominating thyroid hormone are. There haven't been a lot. I've just yeah. seen in animal studies, they just say it, but they don't really say what the consequences are. But it ain't going to be good because that's not how we were designed. And there are other studies that show all these halides increase your risk of thyroid problems, including thyroid cancer, breast cancer, you know, ovarian cancer, and so on. And you know, it's, so we're we're getting exposed to these toxic halides in our water supply and fluoride. We're getting exposed to these toxic halides in our drug supply as fluoridated and brominated compounds that are taken as common drugs. A lot of antidepressant medications have fluoride as their chemical makeup. A lot of asthma drugs have bromine as their chemical makeup. Um, bromine's in food and drink. Yes. You know, it's brominated vegetable oil. Bromine is a fire retardant used all through the United States. It's in so many consumer goods. It's in these things. It's in uh, mattresses and carpet and curtains and couches, chairs, you know, as a fire retardant. Our exposure to bromine is so much higher than our predecessors. Therefore, it's caused competitive inhibition of iodine. And the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study, which the U.S. government does every 10 years, shows that our iodine levels across the country have fallen over 50% over the last 50 years. And at that same time, our bromide levels in my testing has gone up and it's created this, this double whammy of iodine deficiency, bromine toxicity. And I think we're suffering the consequences of it. And these cystic breasts and cysts and nodules in the thyroid and the ovaries and polycystic ovaries and right. endometriosis and the whole nine yards, you know, that's, that's what we're seeing right now. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience.
So this makes so much sense because we have the double whammy of decrease, and I'm assuming in our soils and depletion of uh, sources of iodine, number one, and then we're getting these massive exposures that are competitive inhibitors of um, and absorb into our bodies. And uh, and even like thinking back on the farm, organophosphates by nature have a chlorine molecule attached to them. So there's that chlorinated exposure. Anytime you swim in a pool or sauna or hot tub that's brominated or chlorinated, or I was a swimmer growing up, so there was another big exposure, right? Um, so what do you see? We talked about like cyst on the glands and things. Um, I'm assuming that we could probably assume all of us are iodine deficient. I would say, so talk to the person, like who, how would we know we're iodine deficient or is it just everyone? So the NHANE studies showed iodine levels have fallen over 50%. So if you, if you look at the national studies as a population, we're deficient in iodine. Average population is deficient in iodine. Now that's going by WHO criteria. My feeling is in today's toxic world with our exposure to all of these toxic allies and these other chemicals, our iodine requirements are way higher and the WHO criteria is too low. Yes. Iodine, iodine was set at the RDA of 150 micrograms in adult male and female per day. It, from 1920s research on, um, it was done in Michigan and Ohio, which we were in the goiter belt. And they, they were concerned with, there was a huge huge rate of goiter in people in the, in the early 20th century. And as the country was expanding from east to west, this goiter rate went through the roof, and it became it became of interest to the highest levels of the U.S. government. Not so much because people were suffering goiter, but animals were having problems. Uh, yeah, and animals' thyroids were not developing normally, and the animals were not procreating correctly. They weren't growing to the right size, and it was ascertained as, that the animals were suffering the same iodine deficiency that people were. So there was a researcher, David Marine, who was a graduate of Case Western Medical School. He had written a paper on iodine in med school and must have come to the someone in Washington and found it because they tasked him with looking at farm animals and and seeing what's the lowest dose of iodine we give to farm animals that's going to correct their thyroid problems, their procreation problems, and their growth problems. So he put different amounts of iodine in the feed and the lowest amount he reported for animals. They calculated the dose per weight for mm -hmm. humans mm -hmm. and they said, this is how much iodine humans need, 150 micrograms a day. So it was known from research 50 years before that, that I, you could get iodine into salt yes. um, pretty easily. So and it would be a good way of population wise to get people to take iodine. So they government uh, persuaded salt manufacturers to put 75, uh, I, I think it's micrograms per gram of iodine in salt. And we would get a, a little over 150 micrograms per day, you know, doing that. Yeah, so they did the first studies in Ohio and, and second studies were done in Michigan and goiter three years later went down, you know, a, a huge percentage. And so the government, they didn't mandate it, but they suggested salt manufacturers put iodine in it. That's how we came up with iodized salt. Got it. And it was hailed as the first public health miracle, which it was. But remember, that was a different time period. Yeah. People weren't exposed to these chemicals, these bromine and bromide and fluoride wasn't in the water. And so it was enough iodine to prevent goiter in the vast majority of people. The animals were fine at that point. And that's how the, we're still living off that a hundred years later when we're living in a different world right now. And it's, it's, it's that that's a past time. And so that's why our iodine requirements are higher than they were then. And this is why I think we're having so many problems now with our gland tissue. And, and um, until we rectify this, I, I don't, I don't know how we get out of this mess. No, I couldn't agree more. And like, I talk a lot about toxic chemicals in our environment and flame retardants are in everything, unless you're in California and even there, it's sometimes hard to get a mattress that's free. free. So any furniture you buy, if you're out there, any sort of a thing in, in your home, it's mandated to have flame retardants on these things. So it's actually, you have to be incredibly deliberate to get something for your household that doesn't have completely um, saturated with flame retardants. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And then now if you get deliberate, you have to spend a lot of money. Who, who yes, afford yes. It? It's two or three times or more. Like well, the mattresses. Some people that can afford it, but the masses can't afford it. And then, you know, then then we're then we're going to be diagnosing breast cancer in women when they're yeah. eighteen years old, and pancreatic cancer, and people when they're forty years old, and you know, stuff that I didn't see thirty years ago that I'm seeing now. And we just nobody seems to care. Nobody, everyone just besides the holistic doctors, nobody seems to care out there. Well, and let's talk about that real quick, because part of it is, and part of it, why the medical curriculum is run by pharmaceuticals is because there's big money in these blockbuster drugs that have a patent where no one else can use that drug, where iodine is not that way. Do you want to talk just briefly about why iodine is, is essential, but also not pushed by any manufacturer because of cost? 
So in the in the in the 19th century, iodine was the most used medical item. Mm -hmm. Lugol solution was designed in the 1820s by Dr. Lugol, and he figured out how to get iodine into solution so people could take it. And it was the most prescribed item because the biggest killer in the 19th century and early 20th century before antibiotics was infection. And yeah. there's no bacteria, no virus, no parasite, no fungus that's shown to be resistant to iodine. So people, you know, it was sold at every apothecary and people readily used iodine. Doctors wrote about it. Lots of old case histories, lots of old literature of iodine uh, curing Graves disease, you know, which I still use in my practice today, even though, you know, I get criticized for that by even my holistic colleagues, some of them. Um, but um, so iodine was well used until right around with iodine salt. When iodine salt cured the goiter epidemic, iodine fell out of favor. And right after that is when when um, drug patents started to come up and, you know, things move fast and iodine was cheap. It was not patentable because it's a natural substance. And iodine deficiency was the thing of the past. I was taught that in med school. I, I was probably, I was taught probably. Yeah, me too. One minute or less of iodine, that iodine deficiency was causing, causing goiter in the 19th century and the early 20th century and was cured with iodine salt. And I bet you that was it. I don't recall anything else about iodine. And, um, you know, unfortunately, iodine gets a bad rep. So there, there's a lot of conventional doctors and endocrinologists, they, they can't stand iodine. And unfortunately, it's pervaded our holistic world as well. And a lot of there's a lot of negative talk about iodine. I don't understand it. It's because they don't, I call them medical iodophobics. Um, they must not know the physiology and biochemistry of it. They don't know the literature. You know, in our office, we, I like seeing Graves patients. Graves patients are fairly easy to treat with a holistic approach as iodine being front and center of part of that holistic approach. Hashimoto's disease is caused by iodine deficiency. Iodine treats Hashimoto's disease and cures it many times. I have two girls both diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease by their mother. Cause I was, they were like the shoemaker's kids without shoes. <laughs> um, and they were diagnosed by the mother. Well, the mother asked me around 11, do you think yeah. they have a thyroid problem? And I'm like, Oh, how did I miss this? They were <laughs> headachy and they were, you know, they were busy playing soccer and all that stuff, but they were complaining being headachy all the time and tired. And I drew their labs and they both got Hashimoto's and thyroid, you know, was messy. And, I, when I lecture, I show their labs and I show the progression as we up their iodine dose, what happened to their, their thyroid antibody titers and they go down. Haley's 29 years old, Jesse's 28 years old. Neither of them have signs of Hashimoto's. For a hypothesis to withstand, a, a, a hypothesis has to withstand all criticism. So if these, if these doctors, I'm talking about my holistic colleagues, yeah. particularly these naturopaths, there's a few of them out there that say, you know, iodine causes Hashimoto's and Graves disease. Well, I got an N of two I grew up with, or I raised. Yeah. Well, I've got the lab work to show you that they don't have Hashimoto's anymore. This blows out of the, hypo out of the water that I then causes Hashimoto's. And the other thing that blows it out of the water is I think levels over the last 50 years have fallen 50% across the United States from the NHANE study. Hashimoto's and Graves' disease have increased at remarkable epidemic rates since then. The, the two curves are going, one's going up this way, one's going down this way. That's a negative association. Mm -hmm. Now, a negative association disproves causation, period. It ain't iodine. Yes. Maybe it's something else, but it ain't iodine. So, you know, as Ricky said to Lucy when I was growing up, explain that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, none of them can explain that one. And that's just not the case. Love it. I could not agree more. So talk to the person out there who's like, oh, do I need iodine? We're assuming most everyone does need iodine. Do you uh, recommend they ask their doctor to test? Do we just assume? Because I know there is testing, but even in my clinic, I find that it's harder. Sometimes I make an assumption versus testing. What's your recommendations on that? My first recommendation is for a patient to work with an iodine literate doctor, period. Forget the testing part of it. Just work with someone who's knowledgeable about iodine, who can talk to you about it. Do I think every person needs to be tested for vitamin C before you give them vitamin C? No. Do I think everyone needs to be tested for magnesium before you prescribe magnesium for migraine or muscle aches and pains or muscle spasms or something? No. Do I think everyone needs to be tested for iodine? I think once a doctor has experience in the, you know, when using it, no. The answer is clearly no. When I first started using it, I tested everybody. I, I still do, do testing on almost everybody. I do testing on everybody. But it's more for my research purposes. I don't really feel like I need, need to. I just keep track of them. And you know, in my office, we've tested over 8,000 people over the years. 
we, there's a few doctors that work with me and we found over 97% are iodine deficient, mostly severely iodine deficient. The only ones that aren't usually have either seen me lecture or read my books or they're friends they're already or, on the iodine. Are friends you or family that's told them you need to take iodine or take an iodine. But everyone, no one who's not taking iodine is not iodine deficient. That's what I've pretty much, you know, that's unless you're taking iodine in our world with our exposure to these toxic halides, it's, it's near impossible because our food supply has been depleted of iodine over the years too, as you, as you mentioned earlier. And many people in the holistic realm are taking Celtic sea salt or some sort of salt that is not iodized. Right. So then we have that as well. If you do test, are you doing 24 hour urines? Are you doing spot check? Are you doing anything you recommend if a doc's listening, what they would, how they would test? So if, if patients aren't taking iodine, not supplementing with iodine, they can do a spot urine test and it, it's going to come up below 97%, you know, over 97% of the time. If they're taking iodine, the spot urine test doesn't work anymore because there's no there's no reference ranges for taking iodine as a supplement in the doses I'm recommending, milligram doses. Mm -hmm. So they got to do a 24 hour urine test. It's cumbersome. Doesn't, you know, it's, it's 150 bucks or something like that. Um, I really, I, I only do that test now just for research. If I'm really like interested in something a patient has and, or the patient's interested in it. Otherwise yeah. I just do spot urine iodine it's on every new patient as long as they're not taking iodine. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing and, and agree with you. And my clinical experience is very, very low. So then uh, recommendations for supplementation, if the patient is out there and they think they might be iodine deficient, which we just established is almost everyone, what kind of recommendations could you give to the public um, that would be safe to start? So the, the real contraindication to iodine is a condition called an autonomously functioning thyroid nodule. So you have you know, your thyroid gland here and you have this disrupted architecture because they're iodine deficient and they're, they're, they went from cysts to nodules and somewhere between nodules and hyperplasia that one of the nodules becomes, it loses control. Yeah. So loses the negative feedback loop for the thyroid, the thyroid controls, you know, how much thyroid hormone to make. So when you give iodine, they become hyperthyroid really fast, you mm -hmm. know, and if they, these are the people in tolerating seafood or, or sea vegetables, you know, so they get any iodine in, they yes. become hyperthyroid. You know, you can tell who these people are because you give them a dose of thyroid and they, they're becoming hyper within hours of doing it. And in, in 25 years of using iodine, I've seen three people with this. Now, the only way to diagnose it is you give them something with iodine and this happens, or you do this um, radionucleotide iodine test where you see if they've got a hot nodule, it takes up a lot of iodine. Um, so in, in these patients, they can't take iodine until they get surgery mm -hmm. or something to get that, that hot nodule resolved. They cannot take iodine. Barring that, iodine's pretty safe. Yeah. And so with adults, my usual dose is 25 milligrams, which is way more than the RDA for iodine. It's a hundredfold, two and a 250% of the RDA for iodine. Um, and um, if they have glandular disease, thyroid ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, pancreas, particularly cancer glandular disease, I'll use more and I'll I'll titrate your dose up pretty quickly with it. But the one thing iodine can do when you give people these big doses is, is displace bromide, particularly. Dr. Abraham was my mentor in iodine. Him and I and some colleagues did some research. We, actually, we, it was him and I really did the research on our patients. And what happened was we, we could document that, um, and I wrote that in my book, that a study of breast cancer patients versus non-breast cancer female patients, that um, their iodine levels in the breast cancer patients were 50% lower than the non-breast cancer patients, and their bromide levels were 50% higher yes. when, they, when they took iodine to displace bromide. So what can happen is when you give iodine, it can cause a detoxification reaction and an overload where yeah. the body has to get rid of these halides, these bromide I think it's all bromide, but they have to get rid of these halides and the body can become overloaded with them. People can feel crappy and they can get achy and flu-like and headachy and tired. And they don't like that. So if you give iodine, I never give iodine without salt. And I wrote a book on salt, salt your way to health. Most people are salt deficient. Yes. Um, and I prescribe salt for most of my patients, but particularly if I give them iodine, I tell them take a teaspoon of, of unrefined salt a day, as long as they don't have congestive heart failure and or, and or renal failure. Um, and um, the salt helps to usher the bromide out of the body safely. Now, fluoride, you would think iodine would competitively inhibit fluoride. Dr. Abraham and I couldn't show that. And part of it was 
Fluoride is so electronegative and so small and so toxic to the body. Fluoride is, your body does not like fluoride floating around. So your body, when you ingest fluoride, it immediately throws it into the bones or the teeth, yes. trying to neutralize it. And um, so we, we couldn't measure that in the urine when we gave people iodine. We could measure a lot of bromide coming out. And so I, I think that that's, you know, that makes sense. I've seen the acne, of course, the, you know, chlorinated, bromonated oh, stuff come yeah. out there. Um, forgive my ignorance here, but as far as basic detox for these compounds, bromines and chlorines and that halide pathway, is it mostly through the liver? Is it through the kidney? Is it all sources? Is there any particular like sauna that would help or other detox methods that would help get the bromines out of the body? So some, some comes out in the salt, in the sweat. Yes. So you can use detox that way. Some comes out in the stool. But 98% of iodine and bromide will come out through the through the urine. Ah, okay. Fluoride does not come. We 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 tried to measure it, we just couldn't yeah. measure it. And I think it's just because it's so toxic, but it doesn't want to move it around. Yeah. And so most of it comes out through the urine. Um, um, so you, you know, it's 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 but I think sweating helps, you know, all the detox stuff helps. There's no question. But the the old way of you know, bromine toxicity was common in the medical literature in the early 20th century because excuse me, a lot of drugs have bromide in it. Bromide, um, it's a sedating halide. Yeah. So they had a lot of drugs that have bromide in it because it would calm people down. Right, right. And, and, I, and I'm old enough to remember bromoseltzer. Uh, bromoseltzer was the precursor to Alka-Seltzer. Oh, wow. And so people would become bromide toxic. They show up in the emergency room uh, delirious and hallucinogenic, and they would diagnose bromine toxicity, and they would, they would salt the bromide out with a saline IV. And wow. Um, so the, the, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the, um, organo, organo pesticides, mm -hmm. organophosphate pesticides. I don't think the chlorine is the biggest problem. Uh. I think chlorine is a toxic, it's, it's an, it's an oxidative form of chloride, right. but we have chloride receptors all through our body. I mean, we have a lot, we have over a gram, if we burned our body and just had dry weight of the, of the ash, uh, a gram of that ash would be chloride. A gram of the ash would be sodium. And every cell in the body needs and requires chloride. The, the bigger problem is bromide, bigger problem is fluoride. And I think with the organophosphates, it's what they do to the enzymes that is yeah. is the problem. You know, the that, endocrine disruption is probably the bigger issue, right? Yeah, that yeah. Of the effect. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, and then you mentioned Lugol's, is that still, I mean, I know there's like triiodine out there. What kinds of forms are best for patients to take? Is it the multi-triiodines um, or the Lugol's or what do you recommend? So there are many forms of iodine. There's microgram dosing, like 150 micrograms is the RDA for iodine. So there's a microgram dosing of iodine and um, I can't think of some of the names of them, but, um, and then there's milligram dosing. So Lugol solution, Dr. Lugol invented Lugol solution in the 1820s and 5% Lugol is one drop is, is um, 6.25 milligrams of a combination of iodine and iodide. Um, so, um, in our toxic world, I don't think there's enough iodine in the microgram doses of iodine out there to to Too much, help yeah. the body detox from bromide and fluoride. And and it's I've tried it; it just doesn't give you the benefit, the long term benefit that the milligram doses do. And you know, I, I've been criticized for this. And look, if these people will say you made these, you know, they've written about you made these numbers up, you know, 12, 25 milligrams or whatever, fifty milligram loading. You just pull them out of the air. No. Yeah. We give lectures. I'm giving a talk with Lindsay Berkson about this. And I, I present in that talk, you're going to present the link for people, but I presented on iodine. We can show you where these numbers came up. These were not made up numbers. These were using science to decide that really the best doses is somewhere around 50 milligrams a day that you can saturate the thyroid with, the, the, the thyroid can take up a certain amount of iodine per day and then it stops, 600 micrograms a day. If, if you expose someone to radioactive iodine, such as a nuclear explosion, or you give them an IV of radioactive iodine, um, if they're iodine deficient, the thyroid will take up a lot of that radioactive iodine because the receptors are empty and they're mm -hmm. looking for iodine. Um, however, if your iodine is sufficient, the receptors shouldn't be looking for iodine. They're already bound with iodine. So if you give someone radioactive iodine or expose them to nuclear fallout or something, the iodine is going to pass right through and not cause any problems. Um, so I say you should be taking in enough iodine so radioactive iodine is not going to bind to your thyroid or your breasts or your ovaries or your pancreas or the prostate. And you're going to maximize 
how much the thyroid takes up a day, which is 600 micrograms. So you can make thyroid hormone. Yeah. And when you graph those two out, which Dr. Abraham did, it comes in around, right around 50 milligrams a day, maybe 75, but it's, mm -hmm. these are, these are big doses. These are 400, 500 times ERD for iodine. So these numbers were not pulled out of the air. These are what the numbers are. And I don't think the microgram dosing of iodine provides enough oomph for what people need today. Yeah, I agree in clinical practice. I see that. And uh, so completely agree with you on that front. Um, so last little bit here, is there anything that we talked just briefly? So say someone is starting iodine under an iodine certified or knowledgeable physician. Um, you mentioned the detox. Is there anything else that they would be concerned about if it happens like good or bad? I expect some of the detox reactions, maybe some fatigue. What would be a typical like first four weeks of taking that new dose for someone to expect? What would they experience? Well, I, I would think you you may agree with me that what I'm going to say, or you may not I find out, but you know, there's a lot of nutrients out there. A lot of things we learn in our holistic courses and we learn and we, we try on people and there's very few things people take that they say, wow, that made a difference. Yes. A lot of times you can take, I'm just throwing. Some I agree. Out. A lot of times it's like, you can't tell in the first you tell. You give them these technologies, you give yep. them yep. whatever it is. And, you know, they don't know. And sometimes we don't know, you know, is it, is it really helping? We think this will help your varicose veins or something, but you know, who knows? But, um, um, iodine is one of those things that when people are deficient, as long as they don't get a detox reaction, when they start taking it, they get a wow factor. They usually get more energy. They start dreaming again. Their brain becomes focused. And, and I've only seen this with a couple of things, you know, in the natural world where, you know, that, that can be a wow factor. And I mean, the other wow factor is that thyroid nodules go away, breast cysts go away, um, you know, ovarian cysts go away, you know, and, and things like that. But that you can get that sort of immediate energy boost, brain boost, you know, mm -hmm. the eyes are clear, you know, every, everything just gets better. And, yeah, and I didn't one of only a couple of things that I've seen that happen with, you know, over 30 years. So um, to avoid, so occasionally you'll get a detox reaction. You don't feel good when you start taking it. What I tell those people, stop taking it, go on a teaspoon of salt or two a day for two weeks, try it again with a teaspoon or two of salt a day, 90 eight, 99% of them can take it without the problem. And there's an occasional patient that either has some kind of sensitivity or allergy to it, or doesn't feel right on it. And th those are few, very few and far between in my practice. Excellent. That makes perfect sense. I know Dr. Brookson and I, which we're going to talk about the course you guys have coming up shortly. So stay tuned. We're going to have a link to that. Super excited to promote and, and share that work because we're going to talk about hormones and iodine. But as we talked just recently on a recording, we talked about women who are starting hormones and have breast tenderness and how iodine can be a huge factor in decreasing their symptoms when they're starting estrogen hormones. Any thoughts on that or comments? Well, yeah. So the, so the highest concentration of iodine in the body is in the thyroid gland. Thyroid can saturate out of 50 milligrams. But if the whole body's saturated with iodine, head to toe, you can have two grams or 2000 milligrams in there. So 50 milligrams isn't a lot, yeah. you know, it's, it's the highest concentration. The second highest concentration of iodine is either in the ovaries or the breasts. There's some, I'm not quite clear on that one, but um, it concentrates in the, to concentrate in the glandular tissue. We are set up with this intricate mechanism where the sodium iodine symporter, which is a taxi cab that takes iodine from the blood, moves it into these glands and requires two atoms of sodium. So you need salt to be able to do this. And it requires ATP or an energy molecule. It's so important for the body to get thyroid in the thyroid and the ovaries and the uterus and the breast and the prostate and the pancreas that it it's, it it uses up an, a, a very precious ATP molecule to move one atom of iodine into those glands because you can't, not only can you not make thyroid hormone without iodine, you can't make adrenal hormones, sex hormones, any of the glands can't make their hormones without iodine. And so... You know, it's a pretty important thing. And um, if we just, you know, I've, I've always been under the premise, if we give the body its basic raw materials, it can do pretty cool things. And when we screw up the raw materials and then when we toxify the body, that's when problems start to develop. No, I couldn't agree more. Was it Sid Baker who said, you know, just give it whatever, take away the excess of toxicity and give what you need. And that's the core of integrative functional, right? Yep, that's what he <laughs> yeah. said. Yeah. And I'm not saying that very eloquently, but well, bottom, that's exactly what yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, uh, tell us briefly about um, what the course is you have coming up because I'm super excited about that and want to share people that link. Well, and join. Lindsay's been a friend of mine for, we were, we were at a course 
I think it was about 25 years ago. I'd written my book, um, 1998. It was right after around 2000 or something like that. I had written my IDM, my first edition of my IDM book. So I was at, I was at a, it was an A4M seminar. I was lecturing on the book. So I had read Lindsay's book. Um, what was her big book? Hormone Deception. Somewhere it was written around then. Whenever, and so I, I, mean, I think she wrote that book in the 1990s. So mm -hmm. I love that book. Yeah. And um, if you don't have the book, it's for anyone listening. Her book, Hormone Deception, is a great book. So she was writing about endocrine disruptors before anybody was writing about them. And that these are causing the breast problems and the ovarian, you know, the glandular problems that are out there. Mm -hmm. And um, so so this woman answers, asks me a question from the back of the audience. And I answer the question. And I go to the next question. I come back to her. I'm like, why did you ask that question? She goes, well, I wanted to know the answer. I said, who are you? Because it was a really intricate question. And <laughs> she gives me her name. And I'm like, I just read your book. I said, I <laughs> and went back to you. I, I figured that question came out of her book. Yeah. And I said, we have to talk after this lecture. I'm a big fan of yours. And then I went back and you know answered all my questions. We we connected that meeting. like, And it was almost like, I don't know if she'll, I'm sure she would say the same thing. But it was like we were, I don't, we, we'd known each other for decades or something. Like we immediately made a connection. And um, we exchanged numbers. And then over the years, we didn't see each other very much at all, but we would talk periodically. And, you know, we'd call each other with certain questions or, you know, something we've read and something we wanted to talk about. And it was interesting. We were always on the same page, always. So she started telling me about 10 years ago, we need to do a course together. Like they're not teaching these hormone therapies the right way. And her and I always came to, we weren't, we were taught differently. We came to, she's a few years older than me. She looks a few years younger than me, but she was a few. <laughs> years, <laughs> no, um, no, but she, um, we we came to the same conclusions clinically, like through different pathways, and so her, the turning point came maybe uh, I don't know. It was within the last year. She she's lecturing a lot more than I was. I did my lecturing earlier, and then I focused on my practice, and I got tired of all the traveling and you know right. lecture everywhere like I was doing. So she's still lecturing, and she tells me she's going to these meetings and doctors are being told don't prescribe hormones they cause cancer or, or don't do it this way and you're going to cause cancer and they're wrong they're absolutely wrong and she said we need to do a course together so she proposed to me maybe six months ago let's do a course and i'm like mm, you know i'm busy i'm practicing I'm, you know I'm writing a book still and I, you know I, I agreed to do it so we, we've been taping now and we just finished a tape right before your talk, two hours. I told Lindsay, this is the best course. And I used a little adjective uh -huh. before yep. the course there. And I said, this is the best course I've ever seen. I mean, this this stuff, you know, we got 70 years experience between the two of us. And we got all the literature. We got all the science behind it. And it's really interesting how we've sort of dovetailed. And here we are, 16 hours. Her, We're taking turns doing these lectures. There's one part that we don't agree on. I mean, it's a, it's a small part on Soy isoflavone. She uses a lot of them. I don't use much of them. Out of 16 hours, that's the one thing we we tend wow. to disagree with out of this whole thing. And um, so I'm excited about it. I'm glad I'm doing it. I'm glad she talked me into it. And it was really cool to sort of put all my info together and really go back to the literature and really support what I do. And, you know, I, these medical iodophobics are going to have to explain, explain a lot of stuff. And in it up. Well, Dr. Bronstein, I have always been a fan of yours. I know we haven't met in person, uh, at least recently. We've probably seen each other in these same circles, but the same thing when she said she was doing that course, I said, I've got to help you promote this because I agree. I think there's so much misinformation out there. I teach at a forum as well. And it's just so sad to go one morning lecture and then the afternoon and you hear these totally contradictory things that really what aren't. Are that, what are new doctors going to do? You know, well, yes, no. Yeah. I mean, what yeah. are they going to do? And, you know, big pharma wants the fear there because that's how they control us. They control right. us during, they control us during everything through fear. And, you know, um, and, you know, well, I'm excited. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I'm going to be promoting this. And so if you're listening out there, I, we have a lot of physicians, a lot of practitioners who watch this. If you are a practitioner, you want to be in this course. Absolutely. Wherever you're listening to this, we will have the links there. And I just want to thank you for taking the time because I know how many other things are on your plate. And I am so excited to be part of the course as well, to listen and, and learn from both of you. Well, I'm happy to be here. I've been a big fan of yours and we're going to meet face to face sometime and, uh, <laughs> together and we'll get a meal together.
Awesome. Thank you so much for today for all your time. And uh, if you're listening and you want to get a link to that course, just look in the show notes and it will be there. Um, and that is, give us the date. It's uh, live. It's April. So last Friday and Saturday of April, but it's going to be recorded. So, yep. they, watch. so wherever um, you're listening, whatever. Credits. We're getting 16 CME credits for it. Oh, that's impressive as well. Well, thank you again for all the work you've done. Uh, thanks today for your insight on iodine. I'm super excited to share this episode.